Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Nicole Purcell. I'm a neurologist and the Senior Director of Clinical Practice here at the Alzheimer's Association. I would like to welcome you to the March Alls Talks. If you're new to joining Alls Talks and this is your first time joining, um, I'd like to introduce you to Alls Talks being a series that provides information, education, news, and resources on a variety of dementia and caregiving topics. Right now I have with me Betty Groves, and Betty is part of our early stage advisory group here at the Alzheimer's Association. And what that means is that uh, Betsy um, serves a function uh, to ensure that she gives a voice to persons living with dementia and their caregivers to make sure that she advises us um, to make sure what we're doing at the Alzheimer's Association is, is appropriate and is beneficial to the constituents that we serve. So I'm going to introduce Betsy and I'm gonna let Betsy um, introduce herself and give us some background on um, her journey with getting a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So Betsy, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, Dr. Purcell. And thank you for, and to Alzheimer's for um, giving us the space to um, be able to give you information and perspectives. Um, I am a, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my experience with my primary care doctor. And I'll start by just a little bit about myself. I'm a 73 year old woman who was diagnosed one and a half years ago with early stage Alzheimer's disease. I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I am a wife, a mother of two children, and the grandmother of three children, all of whom live nearby. And that's a blessing, believe me. As a clinical social worker, so I was claimed, I have a master's in social work uh, degree. I worked for many years as a director of an early childhood mental health program in one of the hospitals here in the Boston area. I then moved to teaching taking on a position at Harvard's Graduate School of Education, where I taught courses on early childhood mental health and child advocacy. In my later years of teaching, I began to worry about my memory. I was confusing the names of students. I was fumbling for words at times. And I finally decided that maybe, you know, I was starting to age out a little bit, whatever and whenever that is. Uh, but I decided that maybe it was time for me to retire from teaching. So in my annual visit with my primary care doctor that year, I brought up the subject of my memory and my experiences with teaching. She reassured me that my worries were common during the normal course of aging and that I shouldn't worry. I remember that she added a humorous comment about, quote, you, you high-powered Cambridge women who always worry. And don't get me wrong, I was very fond of her. I, I wasn't in the least bit offended by this. Um, she was a wonderful doctor, um, and she had a sense of humor. So that was the end of our conversation. And wanting to believe that this was not a problem, I didn't ask any more questions. I simply let it lie. In subsequent visits, she did not ask anything else about my problems. And I assumed that what I was experiencing was normal. A year or so later, a nurse practitioner and close friend whom I confided in recommended that I get neuropsychological testing to assess my memory. Uh, I went to my doctor to get a referral for this and she was quite willing to do so. And the rest is history. The outcome of the neuropsych testing was a tentative diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and this was later confirmed by a spinal tap, um, which showed uh, biomarkers in the uh, spinal fluid for the disease. So I think what uh, is important about your story is one is I think we can all realize what an articulate and educated woman you are. And I think one of the things, I don't know your primary care physician and I don't know what she was thinking, but um, you know, women are more likely to be diagnosed uh, to have Alzheimer's disease than men. And we're not sure why it occurs more commonly in women than it does in men, but it seems like in her thinking, she was thinking that um, 
you know, you're an educated woman, it's less likely to happen to you uh, because we do know that the more education that someone has, the less their risk is of developing dementia. So I think she was thinking, you know, um, you're very articulate, you're educated, this is probably a part of normal aging. Um, and it sounds like she didn't do any um, cognitive screening test on you initially. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Okay. Screen. So what we generally recommend for primary care physicians is to do some type of screening um, or assessment of cognition um, and then discuss other alternatives with uh, making the diagnosis. Um, do you remember when the diagnosis was made. I know you found out the diagnosis on neuropsychological testing, but is there anything that you can share with us, good or bad, about the way you found out or how you felt when the diagnosis was made and you learned about it? So, the, yeah, that's a great question. So the diagnosis was uh, made, the tentative diagnosis, through the neuropsychological testing and then this confirmation with the spinal tap. And the way this was all happening during the pandemic. So the way I found out about my diagnosis was from a phone call from the provider at the hospital um, who shared the diagnosis with me. And needless to say, I was shocked. I mean, I really was in shock. Um, and, um, uh, you know, my husband and I were, it was just this period of grief and um, denial in some ways, wondering if we should go find another medical opinion about this. Um, and fortunately, a, a close friend of mine who was a legal, uh, he's an attorney and was a volunteer attorney for many years with the Alzheimer's Association, which I didn't even know about at that point, I called him. And I didn't know that he had volunteered for with the association. And he knew one of the social workers or workers there, and she called me. And so I was able to do make that connection early on, which has been a true lifeline. So we um, had a long talk with her, I remember, all by on Zoom. And, um, you know, I think that we, through some of her... Um, counseling really and and explaining and sharing her experiences with other people who live with Alzheimer's you know I think it's like moving through a period um, death is too strong to say but it's it's just this period of numbness and then the sense of okay it's acceptance I mean it's it's like it reminds me for some of you I may be showing my age here but the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross stages of grief and so you think about you know, denial, numbness, and acceptance. And so I think we moved through that over a period of probably, you know, a few months and um, began to um, accept it and just think um, about this sense of living one day at a time. And uh, so I think that we have, um, we are still in that period. Um, and... <clears throat> We are, and we are doing okay. I'm doing okay. My, my immediate symptoms that I think are most visible to others, certainly to me, are that I can ask the same question three or four times. I forget, um, I forget where I've put things. I have moments of, th I just was doing this this morning. I had to ask my husband, where's the baking pan? I can't remember which drawer it's in. So there are these little things like that that I'm more aware of. But for the most part, I'm living a good life. I'm volunteering in one of our public schools here in early childhood. Um, my husband and I are traveling. Um, so I feel as though, you know, for right now, we're doing okay. We know there's a journey in front of us. And to some extent, that's where I think some good denial or avoidance is there. There's not much we can do about it at this point. Um, other than to hold on to the hope about medication being approved. So, yeah. So you bring up some very good points. And one point uh, that I'd like to make is that our Alzheimer's Association 2023 Facts and Figures Report, if you're not familiar with this, this is a report that the Alzheimer's Association puts out every year. And it really provides a landscape of what is going on with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. 
um, throughout our country. And it talks about, um, you know, access to, to care uh, providers, um, to physicians and that sort of thing. And I'll get back to that in a minute. But one of the things the facts and figures report pointed out is that patients are often reluctant to discuss um, the symptoms that they're having with regard to their memory or cognition. Our survey shows that individuals experiencing memory difficulties would rather talk to their friends or their family members about their symptoms so that they can compare notes and see if what they're experiencing is normal versus abnormal. And they report another reason for not discussing these symptoms with their doctor, and that's because they're fearful. They're afraid that they may get a serious diagnosis such as Alzheimer's disease. Um, one of the other concerns that they expressed was that um, they may get a misdiagnosis or their primary care physician may want to put them on a medication to start off rather than having discussions about holistic approaches like lifestyle changes or, you know, dietary modifications that someone can make. So it is a very scary diagnosis. And that's one of the reasons that deters people from having these discussions. But I'd really like to encourage people, if they are having problems with their memory or their loved one is having difficulty with their memory, to encourage them to bring them, you know, to the doctor to discuss their symptoms. So um, I know you have the diagnosis of early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Um, have you been able to see a neurologist or a geriatrician or a specialist with regard to your Alzheimer's disease? That is a great question. And the short answer to that is no. We have not been able to see a neurologist yet. Um, even in the medically rich arena of Boston and all of the big hospitals in this area, the area where we live, um, the wait list for, first of all, I don't, I think that they're just not enough neurologists. And Dr. Purcell, you correct me if I'm wrong about this, that there's a shortage nationally of neurologists. And I can only imagine if it's, there's a shortage in Boston, what is it like in the more rural states or, you know, what? So if we simply could not find, we finally had an appointment with one neurologist who like five months out or something. And we got close to the uh, actual time of the appointment and his nurse or his office called and said that he is no longer in the practice. We don't, of course, had no idea what was going on. So we had to go back to ground zero. So um, I'll simply close this by saying, knock on wood, um, we are going to see a neurologist in two weeks for the first time. Good. I'm glad you're finally getting connected because this is a long time in between your diagnosis and seeing a specialist. I will say you are correct with um, the shortage of specialists. So our facts and figures report um, does provide a landscape of the shortage of healthcare professionals that we have, especially in regard to specialists. So approximately 70% of primary care physicians um, work in a rural area. And rural areas are uh, more difficult to find specialists there. So there's 20 states in the United States that are actually what we refer to as neurology deserts, where there's very few neurologists. So the patients in those states don't have access to a neurologist. So the Alzheimer's Association, one of the jobs, one of the things that I do is I work to educate primary care physicians to empower them to be able to take care of patients and individuals experiencing difficulty with their memory or cognition. So you're right. Um, even in in you know Massachusetts, um, where there's you know more heartily available specialists, and you're having difficulty. So it's it's this you know similar picture throughout the United States, even more so in the rural areas. So um, there's some things that that individuals can do while they're waiting to talk to a specialist. Have you found anything that has been helpful for you? And then I'm going to go over some, um, you know, things that individuals can do, but has there been anything helpful that you've been um, doing over the course of the uh, last year and a half while you're waiting to speak to a uh, specialist physician? Um, well, one of the, one way, one medically connected way is that I have, I have a primary care physician who uh, knows me well, and it turns out that her mother has Alzheimer's. 
And so even though she is not a specialist, um, she has been a good resource to turn to if I were worried. And there were a couple of times where um, I was concerned about a medication or she, she has kind of done her best with that. And I appreciate that. You know, I think, so that, that's just being lucky. I think in terms of, of other things to do, and again, I think that there are great resources on the Alzheimer's uh, website about this, about um, what, how we can take care of ourselves better in terms of health. And for, so for me, I've always have enjoyed walking. I fi- have found with my um, disease that I tend to have a little more anxiety than I used to, but if I can get out there and walk, just walk it off, it makes me feel better. So I'm doing a lot of walking. Um, I try to do some yoga or Pilates or something that helps me move around. Um, and I know that, you know, diet is an important um, ingredient. And fortunately for us, I suppose, my husband and I ha- eat a fairly healthy with not a lot of meat diet. And so, and I say that only to say we didn't have to make huge changes in our diet. And I really, I think about my siblings, we have, I have a large family and a whole range of people, you know, in terms of how they diet and having to change a diet is not easy. So Mm -hmm. I, I just want to acknowledge that. Uh, But I think it's worth it uh, because all we know, and Dr. Purcell, you can say far more about it than I can, but diet is diet and exercise, I think, and probably adequate sleep would be. And I, fortunately, I have not had trouble sleeping. I think some people do. So you are correct. So um, when we talk about things that you can do in the meantime, um, we talk about a brain healthy lifestyle. And what we know is what's good for the heart is good for the brain. So we recommend keeping blood pressure under control. If you're overweight or obese, we recommend trying to get your diet under control. And I do know these are very difficult things to do at times. If you're a smoker, we encourage you to stop smoking. Um, We encourage physical activity. um, And it can be something as simple as walking. I like to encourage my patients to walk even just a little bit. I say to them, if you're not somebody who's accustomed to exercising routinely, to just get up and maybe walk outside to the end of your driveway and do that a couple times a week. And then build up, maybe the next week, you'll walk down to the end of your driveway and over toward your neighbor's house and come back and do that several times a week. And then the next week, go a little bit further until you walk about 15 minutes down the street and back. And that's a total of 30 minutes of exercise. And that's standardly what's recommended. So physical activity, we encourage uh, mental or cognitive activity. So doing things, um, training your brain to do new things. Um, is is very helpful. So I even cur- encourage patients that whatever they normally do, to just do it differently. So it'll stimulate different brain cells to be active. And then uh, we also encourage uh, social <coughs> stimulation. So getting out, being social with uh, other people is very important. Um, getting enough sleep is is very important as well. So Um, acting uh, as far as a brain healthy lifestyle or a heart healthy lifestyle um, is are some things that you can do in the meantime while you're waiting to see a specialist. Um, So um, in speaking about uh, sometimes patients are very or individuals are very hesitant um, to come and speak to their physician. Um, What what have you found anything that was helpful for you to make those first steps or even the, the next steps once you were going to the neuropsychologist? Was there anything that was helpful for you that may be helpful for someone else? Um, yes, I, I can think of two things. One is, again, you would, I'm, I want to laugh already. I'm not being paid by the Alzheimer's Association to say rah, rah, rah for them. But once again, the Alzheimer's Association helped us kind of begin the first steps of finding a neurologist. Um, And the other is that I have a friend who was also diagnosed with um, uh, Alzheimer's. And we ended up actually going through her, I mean, not going through her, but using her uh, her physician, whom we have yet to see. This is the one that we're still waiting to see. But I don't know, uh, you know, I'm, I, we weren't sure how else to proceed with this. Um, 
And it's interesting because if I thought about it, I probably should have gone through my primary care physician, which I did not do. We did other other routes, but there are multiple routes, I think, to find it. It's just get finding one and not having to wait so long is the problem. Yeah. So um, so what uh, our survey shows and the facts and figures is that people often individuals feel more comfortable um, going to their doctor with a care partner, so you know, a spouse or a loved one or a friend, um, they feel more comfortable. And the survey shows that um, if they're accompanied by someone else at the visit, that they're more accepting of the diagnosis, they're more accepting of being able to do the testing. And we really have been encouraging primary care physicians um, to just have these discussions with individuals at every care visit so that it becomes routine, it becomes part of the conversation. So it doesn't have to be an awkward discussion or a stigma associated with it, but it's just a natural question that comes up during every care visit. And like I said, if, if there's someone um, that is hesitant to talk to their doctor, if you can go with them or someone you know that they love and they trust, it will help them build relationships with their care providers so that um, as they progress through the disease, that they're comforted by knowing that they have a care partner that's trusted, their physicians that they trust, and that everyone's going to be acting on their best interest uh, as, as they progress through the disease. Um, what, what other questions do you feel, and maybe you don't have any, that would be helpful for our listeners? I know when we talked earlier, you had some questions about um, cognitive screening or assessments. Um, I, I think that would probably be helpful to discuss here. Sure. Yeah, I was curious about, and this goes, come, goes back, I think, to the, the role of the primary care physician and, and you know, do, is this a part of the protocol? Um, you know, how is it used? What does it say? And because I didn't know anything about that. Um, in fact, well, I shouldn't say that. The only and I may have said this earlier in a whole different circumstance when my 88 year old father, I took him to the doctor and he was given one of these short, you know, memory tests. I don't even remember the name of it, but um, so I don't, I don't know much about that to tell you the truth. Yeah. So, so the first step in, in getting memory or cognition evaluated with your doctor is just, you know, taking the first step going to see them, bringing it up during a visit if they don't bring it up with you. And then uh, we encourage primary care physicians to do a brief cognitive screening exam. And really, um, this is a, a brief two to three minute questionnaire that they will ask questions um, to get some information on whether you know, cognition and memory seems normal or it seems abnormal. And then there's more in-depth cognitive assessments that we do that take 10 to 15 minutes. And oftentimes the neurologist and geriatrician do them because they have more time to spend with the patient to focus on memory. Um, but primary care physicians can do that too, but they often are limited by time. So there are different, um, you know, screening tools and assessment tools that we use that will guide us um, you know, to see if there's anything else we need to do diagnostically to, to make a diagnosis. And I will say that one of the important things about getting um, a diagnosis early and having these discussions early is that there are treatments available for Alzheimer's disease. We currently have two medications that are approved by the FDA, but they're indicated for early stages of disease or the mild cognitive impairment stage. So we really wanna encourage people you know, to have these discussions with their primary care physician early, that if treatment is an option, you know, that that should be discussed as part of the care plan. Um, so I think uh, we may be ready for some questions if there's any questions in the chat. Um, Heather, are there any questions that people are asking that we may be able to answer? Yes, thank you both for, for this conversation. It's really helpful and we do have some questions. Um, one of the first ones that someone had shared uh, previously for this conversation was um, maybe something you've touched on as well, but um, this person's dad is showing signs of mild cognitive impairment and does not want to see a doctor about this, doesn't feel like there's a point to trying to get a diagnosis um, 
And they wondered what you would say, you know, to this family, what you would suggest, maybe some of the things that you've shared already, but um, I, this seems like it might be kind of a common situation. Yes, it's very common. So one thing to note is that um, individuals experiencing difficulty with their memory are often unaware of it. It happens so gradually that they often are just unaware of it. So trying to encourage them to discuss their memory when they don't realize they have a memory problem is difficult, but it's extremely helpful if somebody accompanies uh, that individual to the doctor to explain what they're actually seeing. And the doctor can alter the visit and you know, try to start in an informal manner and to, to gather information even outside of any formal testing that, you know, may be uh, making the patient um, not as willing or hesitant to speak to them. Okay, hopefully that's helpful. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the next question we got was, does it make sense to start with a neurologist with one's concerns? Um, and also, what about a primary care with a geriatric specialty? So maybe speaking to those specialties that you both mentioned? Absolutely. So we recommend starting with your primary care physician because they can do a lot of the evaluation and workup. Um, I usually uh, encourage individuals, though, that if, if the testing by their primary care physician is normal, um, but the patient feels that they are having difficulties, true difficulties, then uh, they need to advocate for themselves or, you know, a care partner advocating for them and make an appointment with a neurologist or a geriatrician, and we can do additional testing. Um, so, you know, in Betsy's case, uh, the diagnosis did not come from her primary care physician, and uh, we can let her finish her story of what happens in the end, but um, I encourage, uh, you know, advocacy, and yes, you make an appointment with a neurologist if, you know, things don't work out with your primary care physician. Thank you. And a bit of a follow-up question to that. Are memory screens covered by Medicare? So that's a great question. So if you're a Medicare beneficiary, um, there is what is known as the annual wellness visit. And this is a visit that occurs between the Medicare uh, beneficiary, the, the individual, the patient, and the primary care physician. And part of that is a cognitive screen um, as part of that annual wellness visit. So that should be done annually every year. And then, um, and that is covered by Medicare every year. And then uh, Medicare also allows for a comprehensive care planning visit, which is also covered. And that visit would occur after that initial cognitive screening. Um, if it's abnormal, they can bring you back and Medicare will pay for a comprehensive visit to follow. Thank you. And then, I think we have time for one more question. Um, this one was about when you do get to a neurologist or gerontologist, what do you suggest asking them? And we're trying to get at what's the biggest takeaway from those appointments. So maybe talking through what those conversations are, are like. So the biggest thing is to uh, really uh, try to bring up all the things that you've been experiencing that do not appear to be normal. So maybe you're having difficulty with memory, but maybe you're also having difficulty getting dressed or you're having difficulty with falls. So bringing up everything that doesn't seem to be normal for you and uh, to just get it out there to be seen and to be heard and make sure that you express what's important to you. If you know a medication is not something that you want, make sure that you express what it is you do want. And your physician will you know, take your considerations and discuss an appropriate care plan that meets your needs as well as meets the needs of your health. Okay, so Betsy, would you like to just spend a minute and tell us how the story ends? You're scheduled for a neurologist um, you know, within the next few weeks. And um, you went back to your primary care physician after the diagnosis was made, correct? Correct. Yes, I did. And so, yeah, so the story, I'm not, it hasn't ended yet. Um, well, it hasn't ended yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think it, that's a great question. We're, we're, you know, we're anticipating eagerly the visit with the neurologist. We know there are no magic cures. Um, we're very interested, very interested in 
um, learning more about, as I think I said in the beginning of my talk about the, the new medicines that are on the horizon that we're all waiting for, you know, various federal approvals for. And so to get the opinion of that neurologist, um, meanwhile, I am on one medication that I'm not sure it does much. It certainly doesn't um, hurt me in any way. Um, so I just feel in general like we are at a stage in um, the, you know, long striving cure, not cure, but some effective intervention with this disease. Um, and um, it, it should be a good time. I, I just noticed, and I, because I see one question in the chat, just a little sentence, the question about um, inheritability with Alzheimer's within families. And the question for me was, did I have any family history of Alzheimer's? And the answer is no, I have no family history. Um, I do think, and Dr. Purcell, tell me if I'm wrong about this, that there's an increased risk of, uh, so I have two daughters. So daughters are at higher risk than sons, I think. But there is a risk about kind of intergenerational inheritance or transmission or however you would put it. So Alzheimer's disease can be genetic, um, but we... Uh, feel that 40% of Alzheimer's disease can be prevented with risk modification. And those are the brain healthy lifestyle interventions that I mentioned. And um, so I really encourage that for everyone, not just, you know, individuals experiencing symptoms, but we should all be taking care of our brains, especially at middle age uh, now um, and while we're aging. But um, I think um, this is a good uh, at a good point that uh, we'll need to start signing off. So I do want to thank you very much, Betsy, for uh, being here. I know how difficult it is um, and how much courage that it takes to come and have a discussion about any health or medical issues. So you're very brave, and I do appreciate you being here and everything that you have to offer. And I want to thank all of our viewers and listeners um, for joining us today. Likewise.